So thank you so much for your kind welcome. We're going to look this evening at the well-known account of Jesus calming the storm. And you may be aware that this account is recorded in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark and Luke. But there is one small, tiny detail that Mark includes, which is absent from the other Gospel writers. And it's that one small detail I'm going to comment on briefly this evening. But before I do that, and as you're considering what that small detail might be, let's remind ourselves of the picture all three gospel writers paint for us in this story. Jesus has been teaching all day. At the end of the day, he says to his disciples, let us go across to the other side. That wasn't a simple task. Galilee is seven miles across east to west, 13 miles north to south, and as you'll know, it is a lake subject to sudden storms, gales of great ferocity at certain times, at certain conditions. It was a very dangerous place to be. And this night Jesus is asleep. A windstorm comes. The waves break over the boat. The boat is becoming overwhelmed. And as the storm rages, we see some great contrasts in the passage. You have the fear of the disciples, the quiet calm of the Lord. The disciples are afraid for their lives. Jesus is asleep. Their panic contrasted with his peace, their anxiety with his patience, but most telling of all, their utter helplessness contrasted with his power. They are helpless in the storm. It seems there is nothing they can do. At the end of our passage, we read, they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Do you know what it is to be in a storm like that. And I'm not speaking about those powerful physical events we experience from time to time. Ferocious storms, they must read Chartridge too, I'm sure. Smashing everything in their path. No, I'm talking about storms in life. Do you know what it is to have a storm in your life? A time when a great windstorm has arisen, you feel your boat is filling, you feel it's on the point of sinking, and what's more, if you're honest, you feel utterly helpless against the elements raging all around. Psalm 107, verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city for a dwelling place. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. And then down to verse 23. Those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, 
They see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commands and raises the stormy wind, which lifts up the waves of the sea. They mount up to the heavens, they go down again to the depths. Their soul melts because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. Then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble and he brings them out of their distresses. He calms the storm so that its waves are still. Then they are glad because they are quiet. So he guides them to their desired haven. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Psalm 107 is a psalm about trouble. It's about storms in life. In fact, if you were to give Psalm 107 a title, you could do worse than to quote the words of Job. Man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upwards. Trouble comes in life. It comes to the Christian. It comes to the non-Christians. The Lord Jesus did say, let not your heart be troubled. But he also said, in this world, you will have trouble. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So Psalm 107 gives a very honest assessment of life in the world. There is trouble. It's to be expected. There's something not right. There's something out of sync. We're not right with the God who made us. So trouble will follow in some form or other. But the psalm doesn't leave us there. It is about trouble. But it's also about the kindness, the mercy, the goodness of God. God's love frames the whole psalm. It begins, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. The psalmist speaks of people in trouble four times. He speaks of four different categories of trouble, a constant theme of trouble. And in all of these four circumstances of trouble, we read they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. Those wandering in the wilderness, those who feel desolate in the wilderness, there are those who are imprisoned. There are those who are so ill, they're at the point of death. There are those who are traveling on the high seas. On each occasion, they cry out to the Lord in their trouble and he delivers them out of their distress. What is so remarkable is not that they cry out to God in their trouble, but that God has such mercy and compassion upon them. So my question is, do you know what it is to be in a storm? Like the description we find in Psalm 107, those picked up by the waves and cast down, their courage melts away, they stagger like drunken Men, they are at their wits end, which means all their wisdom has been swallowed up. They simply do not know what to do. What do you do when the storm comes? At this point, there is a great division between men and women. You see, there are those who follow the pattern of that psalm. They cry out to the Lord in their trouble. They recognise there is nothing much they can do. They recognise they are swamped. Their trouble drives them to seek after God. But there are others who in their trouble, they seek to do it their way. 
Their confidence in themselves is shaken, but not overcome. Now, in 1875, William Henley wrote a famous poem. You'll all recognise the end of it. He wrote a famous poem. It's really a biography of his life. He had a very challenging and difficult life. He starts his poem by speaking about his unconquerable soul. He says, you can't beat me. You cannot defeat me, he says. I've had difficult experiences, but I haven't flinched. I'm not afraid at whatever life throws at me, he says. But how does he conclude his poem? He concludes it by saying, it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. We can admire his indomitable spirit, his bravery, his unwillingness to give in. But what of his conclusion? Was he really the master of his fate? Was he really the captain of his soul? He died at the age of 53. Um, he'd been an amputee since a, since a boy. He died falling from a railway carriage. Was he really the captain of his soul when he finally breathed his last and his spirit soared to worlds unknown and he returned to the God who made him? So how are you when the storm comes? Are you like those in Psalm 107 who are crying out to God in their trouble? Or are you like William Henley, self-confident, self-assured, really believing you are the master of your fate and the captain of your soul? Well, here is that little detail in Mark's account of the calming of another storm I referred to earlier. You find it in verse 36, in Mark chapter 4 and verse 36, where we read, now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And other little boats were also with him. The storm will shortly rage, but there are other boats on the lake that night. There are other boats being tossed about in the storm. As Jesus sleeps, there are other boats struggling desperately to stay afloat. So in the time that remains, I'd like to say three things about Mark's little phrase. There are other boats were with him. And the first thought is this. You are not alone in your trouble. The Christian is not alone in their trouble. There are others who are suffering too. In fact, there are others who know what you are experiencing. In fact, there are others whose storm and circumstances seem even more challenging than your own. There are other boats on the lake. I know of a Christian whose life has been devastated in the last year or so. Circumstance have led him to despair uh, God's dealings, a sense of God's chastening hand, a feeling of helplessness in the storm, yet deriving comfort from that thought that there are other boats on the lake. There are other boats in the storm. He confided that in all his trouble, he began to consider those other boats, many of them overwhelmed with higher and stronger waves than he. So even in his trouble, he began to reflect on God's goodness and began to do what we used to teach the children, which was to count his blessings, name them one by one, and to turn again to the God 
who is too kind to be mistaken. He's too wise to be mistaken. He is too good to be unkind. How could John Bunyan speak with such clarity and beauty about being in giant despair's castle, doubting castle? How could he do it? How could he speak about it? How could he speak about being in the dungeon, in the depths of despair? How could he speak about the way out, the key of promise in his pocket? God's promises. Well, of course, it was because he himself had been imprisoned in Bedford jail for his preaching. And if you and I were able to see and to understand the comfort and blessing multitudes of Christians have experienced when reading about giant despair, when they've been in Doubting Castle, surely we would take poor John Bunyan by the hand ourselves, <coughs> gently lead him to Bedford Jail and lock him away. There are other boats in the storm. What would Joni Erickson Tarder say? You know that young girl, the age of 17, suffering a, a terrible diving accident, breaking her neck? becoming a paraplegic for her whole life. What does she say about being in the storm? She said, in the early years of my paralysis, I was horrified at the prospect of remaining paralyzed for the rest of my life. But then she said, God's design began to dawn on me. And I began to pray at times when I did not want <coughs> to pray. I can say, she says, God's refusal to make my life easier has been my greatest blessing. The other boats and the lake that night. So if the first thought is that you're not alone in the storm, the second thought is somewhat similar. You are not alone in the storm. The Christian is not alone in the storm. What matters most, of course, is that the Lord Jesus is in the boat with you. Is Jesus Christ in the boat with you? One old hymn writer was able to write, With Christ in the vessel, I smile at the storm. Does that sound a little bit superficial? In 2024, with Christ in the vessel, I smile at the storm a little bit glib. Well, I can assure you, the hymn writer didn't say that in any way superficially. The one who wrote that suffered much, made many bad choices, went as far away from God as perhaps it's possible to be, was even a man of the sea, spent much of his life at sea, was converted in the midst of an actual storm when he'd given up hope of rescue. He knew the important thing was to have Christ in the vessel with you. If he is in the boat, then the Christian can rest and believe and trust in those wonderful promises that God gives to his children in the storm. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers they shall not overwhelm you. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So if the first and the second thought is, the Christian is not alone in the storm, the third thought is somewhat similar. The Christian is not alone in the storm. Did you notice how Mark adds this little detail in his gospel? You see, you'd expect him to say that there were other little boats with them. But he doesn't say that. It says there were other boats with him. There's something wonderfully personal about that phrase. His presence 
was with those other boats. The Lord of the storm knew all the others on the lake that night. He saw all of his children in their hour of need. He says, I know my sheep. I love my sheep. I call them by name. They are mine. He says, my sheep hear my voice. There were other boats with him. It's personal. For the Christian in the storm, it's personal. Now this year, it will be the 100th year anniversary of the Paris Olympics. And that, of course, was the occasion when, uh, 100 years ago, Eric Little, refusing to run his favoured event on a Sunday, won gold in dramatic fashion in another race. But after the Olympics, as you may well know, he gave up a life of prosperity and ease and fame and travelled to China to become a missionary. In 1945, he found himself a prisoner of the Japanese with 1,800 others. It was a civilian prisoner of war camp in an old school building. There were um, 1,800 uh, people there, many children, um, and the Japanese guarded and surrounded it, but they were responsible for organising everything in the camp. And Eric Little, in particular, organised uh, um, as much as he could do, the studying of the children and activities for the children in such difficult and cramped circumstances. Such was his Christian influence in the camp that one child after his death wrote of him, we had Jesus in the camp and he was wearing running shoes. We had Jesus in the camp and he was wearing running shoes. But in 1945, Eric Little was dying and he was lying in the makeshift hospital on the camp. There were a group of Salvation Army prisoners who would go and play hymns outside the makeshift hospital window. They would send a message inside and ask Eric, what would you like us to play for you? What hymn? And Eric would often ask for his favourite hymn, Be Still My Soul. What comfort it must have been for him to hear these words. Be still, my soul, the Lord is on your side. Bear patiently the cross of grief and pain. Leave to your God to order and provide in every change he faithful will remain. Then later, what comfort to read and sing this. Be still my soul, the winds and waves still know his voice who ruled them while he dwelt below. The winds and waves still know his voice who ruled them while he dwelt below. It was true for Eric Little in 1924. It's true for you and me today. The wind and waves still know his voice who ruled them whilst he dwelt below. Amen. Amen.